Good afternoon, my name is Karen Gordon and I'm a member of the Education Committee and I'd like to welcome you to the Safe Haven Programs, Alternatives to Discipline in Times of Burnout, Mental Health and Substance Abuse. They could have made that a little bit longer, couldn't they? <laughs> Members of the regulatory boards are all too familiar with the challenges that mental health and substance abuse disorders bring to the table. <laughs> Burnout and stress are a root cause of many of the disciplinary actions that the board sees. Offering confidential resources as an alternative in an is an important step for boards to consider in helping get a license holder back on the right track. The speakers for this session are Missy Anthony, Timothy Keck, and Katie Stewart. Missy Anthony is the current executive director of the Ohio Occupational Therapy, Physical Therapy, and Athletic Trainers Board. Timothy Keck, is the public member on the Ohio Board, and Katie Stewart oversees the Health Professions Recovery Program in the state of Idaho. You can see their full bios in the event app. They have valuable information to share this afternoon, and we encourage your participation. However, if you wish to ask a question during the Q&A portion, Members of the Education Committee will provide you with a microphone. We ask that you not just shout out questions or start talking because everything is being recorded. If you don't talk into the mic, it doesn't get recorded. Um, please remember to abide by the rules for asking questions in your handbook. In other words, don't suck the mic. And at the end of the session, there will be a QR code to complete your evaluation, or you can do so on the um, event app. Uh, the Federation values your input after each session. Now I will turn the presentation over to the speakers. Do you want this? I think we're back on. Yep. Okay. I've learned that Slido is a thing. I didn't know it was a thing before I came here. So uh, I think our first slide has to do with uh, starting some engagement here. Are you forwarding or do you want me to? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, space bar. Uh, so I think you click the QR code right now. Professionals. Everybody got it? All right. I think the QR will persevere. Yes, there we go. Okay, so have you ever personally been impacted by mental health, substance use, or burnout challenges? Give it some time to breathe here. Well, good, that'll make this a lot easier. We're at least familiar with some of them. Give it another couple seconds here. Okay. Have you been or have you witnessed a coworker impacted by mental health, substance use, <coughs> or burnout to the extent that it interfered with work? It's like watching the worst horse race. During your time of regulatory board service, have you ever encountered a challenging disciplinary case where mental health, substance use, or burnout were the root cause of an ethical violation? <laughs> we could probably just stop right there. <laughs> I 
think the, wow, everything's working. Uh, I think the interesting one about this is if we'd asked this question maybe five years ago or 10 years ago, like how that would have dynam dynamically been different. Probably even so much if you asked it, I don't know, before late March 2020, right? And then after late March 2020, how this, uh, this would probably dynamically change, especially when it comes to burnout. In your opinion, how, how important is a safe haven program? What? Oh, well, okay. <laughs> go for it. We're going to preempt. Uh, there you go. You guys can read. <coughs> okay. Well, that's good. I don't have to be as persuasive as I thought I would be with the unimportant. And I always like to have some converts by the end. All right, I'll work on the 9% that are neutral. Two or three of you are on my radar. Um, okay. So uh, this was sort of our philosophy as a board is it's time to act, right? This is not necessarily a personal issue or an employer challenge. It really is comes down to public safety. Um, I think when we first uh, decided as a board this was something we really wanted to implement, take it past the conceptual idea and, and, and start to make it, so implement it and, and get the legislation passed and all of the sort of stuff that goes into the, the ball of moving things. Um, we really said, well, to make this, <coughs> I guess, you know, mission-oriented, what were gonna be our objectives? Thank you. And uh, the first one was, of course, raising awareness of how mental health and substance abuse and burnout impacts professionals. Uh, I think, you know, as we saw from the, the, the Slido, most people are generally aware that these things exist, but what they don't really have or, or aware is, is how it exists in their ecosystems, right, where they work, where they live. Uh, most people are pretty good at, at hiding certain behaviors. Uh, some people are very bad at it, and they stand out quickly. Um, the next objective was describing the state uh, professional recovery work program or how the program works. Uh, I think you know, what we really learned quickly was it's important to educate and then educate again and then educate again. Uh, I think to some of the comments that we got in the beginning when we started talking about a, a uh, program for mental health, some practitioners were going, I, that I don't want to have to look for that in all of my patients. And I was like, wait, time out, we're talking about you, not that. So even just what we think is going to sort of be baseline understanding uh, of, of the practitioners, it even took a while to educate what, what we were actually talking about, what, what program, you know, we put everything out for comment. And uh, so that was quite interesting, the feedback we got. And then identify resources available to boards to promote wellness. Uh, I don't know if everybody was in our little lightning round section, but I rattled off some numbers in that, and one of the, you know, I guess the second leading cause of why people didn't get treatment is they didn't know what options were available to them. So, and frankly, when we started to get around, our minds wrapped around the idea of, of doing a safe haven program, we weren't even sure as a board of what options were available. So we kind of put the cart a little bit ahead of the horse without knowing, well, if we're going to implement this program, how, how are we going to implement it? So these, these objectives sort of organically arose. We didn't have to hunt too far uh, to learn what it is or figure out what it is we really needed to overcome. And so I joined the board in 2021, sounds right, yeah, May of 2021, and it was shortly thereafter that we started talking about this. And uh, I sort of ran over to Missy after the first one, and I go, I, I'm, this is something that I'm sort of more personally passionate about than, than maybe I let on in our, our sort of open discussions. And um, so mental health specifically was something that I, I didn't understand. Uh, I, I think most, well, I'm a practicing attorney. I've been practicing for 13 plus years now. Uh, I remember quite distinctly the first time uh, in a professional setting that we were made aware of, of how mental health and substance abuse and behavioral disorders, uh, burnout really wasn't discussed as much, how it can impact a profession. So, um, you know, everyone here is educated, so you get to a certain point in your postgraduate studies where 
you start to realize that everyone around you is used to getting really good grades and then you start to get into these um, sort of little micro sets of classes or, or even a, a, a program and, and you go, well, not everybody here can get an A because they're gonna grade on a curve. And, and so uh, that's the first thing they confronted us with in law school was eh, you're no longer gonna get all A's because well, we, we don't get those. Uh, so to everybody, so I said, okay, that's great. And the next day, a gentleman named Scott Moat comes in, and he, he is, um, attorneys are regulated by the Supreme Courts for their states, um, and Ohio has something called the Ohio Lawyers Assistance Program. And Scott Moat stands up in front of the, uh, this, our group of, of uh, orientation, you know, there's 38 of us, I think, that started in, in this program. And uh, he said, hi, I'm Scott Moat, I'm an alcoholic, and everybody chuckled, and I didn't because my dad had practiced for, at that point, probably 30 years, and I knew the story of Scott Moat before I even went to law school, so I turned to the person next to me, and I go, well, he's serious, so maybe we should listen to this. And Scott starts rambling off uh, numbers, and when he gets to the mental health part, I go, man, I, I don't need to listen to this stuff, man. I am completely, completely prepared for anything life can throw at me. I'm, I'm used to the profession of law, right? It's, this is going to be nothing. And he says, well, as we all sit here, 10% um, of you have a mental health or addiction disorder. And I go, well, that sucks for 3.8 of the people in this room, right? And he goes, by the time you finish law school, 20% of you will have a mental health or substance abuse disorder. And I said, well, that sucks for eight of you, but again, and he goes, and by the time you've been practicing for five years, about 35 to 40% of you will have a mental health or uh, substance abuse disorder. And I said, well, okay, fine, half of these people are screwed, uh, and, and we'll be fine, All right? So fast forward about six years into practice, and uh, one of the men that I revered most uh, was a partner in my dad's law firm. He seemed to have the keys to the you know, crack the code of how to be happy as an attorney. He would take Friday afternoons off, go watch movies, right, and just sort of gave himself the mental space. And I get a phone call from his family that uh, Steve killed himself. And I still, or, no, right, I mean, come on. This is the most well-adjusted man I've ever, I've ever been around. I've known him since I was nine, right? At the time, I would have been older. Uh, and uh, so... It, it, I was like, well, you know, and so I go to the funeral, I talk to his wife, and he goes, yeah, he was really struggling with mental health. No, right? So I go, well, there we go, and, you know, that, Scott was right, this will happen. And then we fast forward to 2020, and I think, you know, everybody thinks the practice of law is extraordinarily complicated, and it's it's full of, 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 uh, all the things that would promote, you know, a decline in mental health, the pressure. Uh, it's a, you know, it is a, a, a profession that does two things automatically. Number one, everything you deal with is inherently negative. Anyone ever here call their attorney because they are having a great day and everything's going well? <laughs> no. And, and it demands a degree of perfection. If I screw up, then somebody else gets harmed, right? And those two things sort of apply to most professions, right? You have a certain degree of, I, I need to get this right, because if I don't, something bad's gonna happen. And uh, nobody shows up to their PT because they're in perfect health and nothing hurts, right? Maybe, but probably not. So we, I was sort of going through paces and <laughs> I distinctly remember when I felt no joy over anything, right? And so I'm thinking about you know, all the pressures and the perfections, and then I go, wait a minute, I, I represent governmental entities. On the lawyer aggression scale, this is like one step above fuzzy pink bunny slippers, right? I mean, we're not in high pressure. If I go to court, it's to say hi to the judge I know down there, right? We, no, you know, again, who fights the state of Ohio, right? I mean, who fights? You know, big governmental entities, I have unlimited budget, you don't, right? So 
you know, I, I don't have these stresses, so what, what is driving this? And like all attorneys that are generally egomaniacs, I can fix it. I can fix it on my own. I don't need help. I don't need to tell anybody about this. I can just deal. So this is probably 2019. Uh, we get to COVID and all of a sudden I'm, I'm happy again because my schedule now came completely my own because I can be home, I can go to the office. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's just what it was. I was going to the office too much. And that lasted about two months, three months. And we get to summer and I'm like, God, things aren't, things really are kind of back to where they were. I'm, I, I suffer in silence. I'm a highly, before any of this, I'm a highly functioned introvert. What that means for all of you is that I'll remember all your faces for the rest of my life and I'll never remember your names, right? So uh, I knew that I had certain things about my personality that were different. I'm like, okay, fine. I, and you start to mentally check boxes of, I'm still okay, I'm still okay, I'm still okay. I function, I don't miss any, you know, all my work's done on time, all my clients are happy, I'm meeting with them, everything I file with the court is, you know, error-free, it's the best arguments we can make. I'm still functioning, right? But the effect that it has on every aspect of my life is just gets denigrated daily. I don't enjoy being around my kids as much all of a sudden. I don't spend as much time with my wife. I, I'm leaving the office a little earlier than I want because I'm starting to get the creep of I don't like it. So I don't know if it, you don't have to raise your hand, but you, maybe you just sort of nod and silently. If anyone here is familiar with depression, the, the, the best way I can explain it is if this is the cure and I'm standing here and I know that to be better, all I have to do is is this, I, I can't move. That's how depression affects me. I'm, I'm intelligent, I'm articulate, I, I can fix things, I can, if it was somebody else, I could tell them, just pick up the cure, man, it's right here. And then you couple with that with crippling anxiety. And the only way that I can describe anxiety is when you go down the hill on a roller coaster and you get those butterflies in your stomach and it's that tingling sensation, I call it jitters, uh, have that when you're watching the news and they talk about rain tomorrow and you almost have a full on panic attack. Not because it's raining, it's because it's something different and it shouldn't bother you in any way, but it does, right? So again, I'm dealing with all of this. I'm still practicing, no one knows. I start to realize that that help is necessary for me. So I go and I, this was about a year, <laughs> again, the cure, right? So a year of, I know I gotta go talk to somebody, I know I gotta go talk to somebody, I know I gotta talk to somebody. And finally in the, in the winter of early, I guess, January of 2021, I finally meet with a clinical psychologist and, uh, Relief immediately, like if anyone goes to a doctor, the things you always want to hear from them is, oh yeah, we deal with this a lot. You don't ever want to hear, I've never seen this before, <laughs> right? Because if there's no telethon for what ails you, you're screwed, right? So <laughs> I'm like, oh good, thanks. Um, and so what it did is it gave me something to chew on. You go through the science of how your brain works and how you cannot think and process your way out of certain things. And the desire to do something is always going to be trumped by the chemical imbalance that exists in your, in your brain. So it doesn't matter how much you will it or want it to happen. It just won't happen unless you get external help. And so I don't think I ever got close to where Steve was. I, I, I never lost a desire to want to get better. I didn't get to the point where you get just desperate and you feel shame. Um, I think shame is what drives most people to not seek help is they don't want to verbalize to anyone that they need assistance because they'll look weak. Um, ego getting in the way of reality is generally the worst concept for anyone to undertake as, as their, you know, how they're going to live their life. Reality is reality. Your, your ability to 
be this battleship that is fully capable of taking on any enemy that could ever come to you is faulty logic because the world is the ocean. One big wave and you're swallowed up and you're gone, right? So I say all of that to say that when this program that we started to talk about came to light, it resonated. We had a program with the, through the Ohio Lawyers Assistant programs. We have a duty report. We have all of the same requirements that most other professions have. Uh, I was lucky because it never, and I stress the word lucky, that it never crept into my professional life, that I was able to compartmentalize and I caught it early enough. But I caught it early enough after living with it for almost two years. I'm probably a rare, a statistical rarity. I think people will devolve faster. And so as you think about this from a, a board perspective and, and, and the public safety, I don't think anyone, based on the type of law I practice, was ever gonna be in physical danger if I made a mistake. But they could have been in pecuniary danger. They could have been in, you know, had something last longer that was bothering them than it needed to because I was delaying. Um, I had enough professional responsibility to know the difference, but a lot of my fellow attorneys don't. Again, the numbers still stay the same. About 30% of practicing attorneys in the state of Ohio have some sort of behavioral disorder, a substance abuse disorder, mental health disorder, or, or are dealing with burnout. And burnout sort of gets <coughs> commingled with these, all these other things, but it really is its own standalone thing. You can be sick of doing something to the point where you decide, I don't wanna do it anymore to your own detriment. I'm sure you guys have to chart everything, right? As soon as you go, I'm sick of charting, and I stop charting, well, that's probably gonna lead to some sort of violation, right? So it's not you don't have a mental health disorder. It's not because you're hitting the bottle too hard or as we learned, for those of you who attended, you're on the jazz cabbage too much, right? So it, <laughs> it, uh, they brought me in for the comic relief too, I think. Uh, yeah, and uh, it could just be that you are literally tired of doing what you're doing. Doesn't make you bad. And what we saw with this program and meeting with the Ohio PHP folks is if you give someone the ability to self-report because they're aware before it gets to discipline that, and you use a program that is proven to be competent and uh, has a great track record of helping <coughs> other professionals. Sorry, I'm dealing with this cough and it won't go away. Uh, that you'll see a, a, a rather large uptick in people wanting to participate in the program and benefiting from the program. And it became sort of my pseudo mission on this board to make sure that all of the different disciplines uh, embraces that, that this is something that we need to adopt quickly. Um, I, I don't, we don't, I mean, you could probably Google the data real fast, how many different professions are losing people to the different aspects that we've talked about today, behavioral health, mental health disorders. Um, but again, I, I was viewed as, as someone that was highly functioning. I would get assigned some rather hefty, complex cases. I was you know, given pats on the backs by all of the officials in the state of Ohio for jobs well done. And so from the outside looking in, I looked like the person that had it pretty much all the, you know, again, crack the code like I thought Steve did, uh, but really was suffering. So as you look around your, your different boards, you look around uh, your different practices, <coughs> if you're in a, room, a large enough room, I'm in the room that we just sat in earlier for the lightning round, a certain percentage of, of you are, are suffering with something, right? And it may be small, it may be large, I heard, um, uh, was it Michelle, I think, say in one of the other meetings that everyone in that room had been dealing with some sort of trauma as it related to uh, uh, post-COVID and whatnot. 
trauma is one of the largest things that leads to behavioral problems, mental health disorders, abuse. Um, you may have lost your job during COVID. That could be traumatic. You, could, you may have lost a friend that died from COVID or something else. And these all, all these traumas. So I would implore you that, that don't let ego get in the way of reality. Take a self-assessment. Take a couple minutes. Talk to somebody that you trust. And, and then think about that as you, as you maybe as boards start to go out and go, do we need to talk to our different providers in the state and see if there's avenues that we could do similar programs? Because you're, it is from a public safety standpoint, if you know that a large percentage of the people that are practicing in your discipline may suffer from this, then I don't know that it's almost malfeasance to not do something. I'll turn it over to Katie. Now that I brighten everyone up, right? Uh. Yeah, uh, just give me one second. So I'm Katie Stewart. I'm a certified drug and alcohol interventionist. I've been working in the substance use and mental health field for 13 years. My mentor, when I started out in the industry, had 30 years of recovery, and this is a video he showed often to explain to people who aren't in the substance use field what it feels like to deal with someone who hasn't come to terms with the fact that they're struggling with substance use disorder. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop they... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. So that's a day in the life of dealing with someone who's struggling with substance use disorder and doesn't quite understand it yet, isn't really ready for step one of the 12 steps to admit to themselves or someone else that they're struggling. And it's hard, you have all of the answers, you know all the things that can help them, but they're not ready. Um, so a little bit about what is substance use disorder. Here's three you know, definitions that are very clinical. Um, but I like to look at it really from a layman's term of addiction as a symptom to an underlying problem. And using the substance solves that problem for the short term while creating long-term problems. Someone who's struggling in that moment, that substance is the only thing that's going to fix that problem. Regardless of the long-term issues it's going to cause, uh, that's what they feel like. Um, often people will say the opposite of addiction is connection. So if you're in connection, you couldn't possibly be struggling with substance use or alcohol use disorder. I would venture to say that's not always the case. In some cases it really is. Someone who's struggling with substance use disorder or alcohol use disorder has lost their connection, but in the beginning, they could be someone who's looking for an extreme experience in a world that's orderly. Your life looks the same every single day, and so you're just looking for something else to spice it up. And so it starts out as something harmless and, and it uh, veers down the path of addiction. It's a learned behavior that once brought you joy that now causes a whole lot of chaos and havoc in your life. Um, a book that I'm currently reading called The Scarcity Brain 
um, says it really well in regards to genetics, because we always say it's a brain disease, it's genetics. Um, I like to think that genetics loads the gun and your environment pulls the trigger. So we may have that switch in our brain that says we are more predisposed for substance use, alcohol use disorder, or mental health, but our environment and what we're around and doing every day could easily pull the trigger for that for us. So perception versus reality. Our society still very much sees substance use and alcohol use disorder as the brown paper bag. Um, those who are struggling couldn't be professionals who are working in the hospital or clinics or owning their own business. They must be living under the bridge or in the downtown homeless community. When in all reality, it's a Stanley Cup. You have no idea what's in that fancy cup. Um, I see TikTok videos all the time of the amount of alcohol that can go in one of those cups. Look at what you can sneak inside of it. Um, and so that's the reality. Um, mom's getting juice boxes and taking them to the park. And you get your juice box and mommy gets her white, wine juice box. And that's the reality of substance use these days. We can't assume <coughs> that the person down by the river is the only person struggling. It's someone who drives a Lexus and has a Stanley Cup that is also struggling with substance use disorder. Um, substance use disorder in the public, the highest rates are between 18 and 25, but we are seeing an increase between the ages of 26 and 49. And as Tim said previously, when we're talking about statistics, 10% of the population on any given day is struggling with substance use disorder. Um, and your, sti your statistics, depending on your profession, you know, go through the roof, but just the normal population, 10% is struggling on any given day. Uh, so prevalence, uh, healthcare professionals are 50% more likely. The amount of stress on healthcare professionals and attorneys, because we have an attorney's program also, is, is much higher than the average everyday individual. Uh, but recovery for healthcare professionals is twice, three times um, more successful than that of the everyday individual. Um, so the, so um, we know that substance use in healthcare professionals is higher. Why is it higher? Why is it higher for the everyday than it is for the everyday individual? And this is, this is complex. You guys are extremely intelligent. It can't happen to me. I have a doctorate degree. I have a master's degree. I know better. This won't happen to me. I heard about it in class. It, yeah, substance use sounds terrible, but mental health, I got it under control. It cannot happen to me. Um, access to care, um, access to substances. Uh, I give presentations to physicians and nurses all the time, and so it's a little different, but the access they have to substances is through the roof, whether you want to think that or not, you know, the diversion of substances. Um, and again, just the ability, the access. So what are some of the reasons for prescription misuse or self-medicating, so alcohol? Um, not all PTs have access to meds. More in the home health setting, you're going to have access to someone's medications. But why would someone go down this path? Um, so managing physical pain. PT is not an easy job. It can be hard on your body. Um, and so physical pain. Emotional distress. So I don't know if you guys know, but there was a pandemic and life got a little bit lifey for a lot of us. Um, and we were in a stressful situation and it became very easy. I think in Idaho, which sounds like Ohio or Iowa, um, for the first time ever, you could have alcohol delivered to your door. That was not an Idaho thing. <coughs> we just made it really, really easy for you to develop a substance use disorder. So if the opposite of addiction is connection, and now we've taken all of your connection away from you, and we're delivering alcohol to your door, the likelihood of substance use goes through the roof. Um, recreational purposes, our society, and while we think that those who struggle with substance use disorder are a brown paper bag, our recreational use of substances is, I mean, what do you want to do this weekend? Let's go out for drinks. What do you want to do tonight? A stressful day at work, we should go out for drinks. It's something that's wildly acceptable, and so you don't realize when someone might be struggling with it. And avoiding of withdrawal symptoms, so people will continue to use for the avoidance of withdrawal. 
We all face stress, but we don't all face it the same exact way. And so Tim and I, Missy and I, we all might experience the exact same thing and have completely different reactions to it. The severity of this stress isn't the same. What's a 10 for me might be a five for them. And what's a five for them could be a 10 for me. And it's, it's my reality and how I take on this stress. And that's the same for every one of you. We have a different way of coping with those stresses. Um, the, we have different ways of facing the patterns of stress. Um, our coping mechanisms are all very different. While we have stress, we all deal with it differently. And then we all did not come into this world with the same brain. So even though we're all struggling and we all had the same exact situation happen to us, we won't deal with it the same because we didn't come into this world with the same brain. So just by a show of hands, because we didn't do a Slido for this, who has a recovery program in their state for medical professionals, healthcare professionals? Pretty good number. So Idaho has a program. I've worked for it for the last 13 years in some capacity or another. Uh, these are the different programs that we have. We started with the Idaho Board of Nursing back in 86. Then the physicians program, sorry, the physicians in 86, the nurses in 96, and then lawyer's assistants in 99, dentists in 99. Pharmacists were a little slow on the uptake in 2008. They don't have their hands in the cookie jar all day long and don't see themselves as having a substance use disorder. And what I saw um, through all these different, in, in um, managing all these different programs is smaller healthcare professional boards didn't have these programs. And I became the executive officer for PT, OT, podiatry, denturitry. There's only 26 of them in the state of Idaho. Um, and they didn't have a recovery program available to them. They didn't have an alternate to discipline. So these cases would be coming before the board. The first reaction would be a stipulation and order. We don't give someone a stipulation and order for not managing their diabetes or their hypertension. So why are we giving them a stipulation and order for brain disease called addiction, substance use, burnout? Just because they have an ethical issue doesn't mean that they deserve a stipulation and order. And so in 2023, the state of Idaho signed a contract called the Health Professionals Recovery Network Program, and now we can offer it division-wide. So right now it's just in our Health Professions Bureau, um, but we signed counselors and social work on like two weeks ago and we're working with massage therapy. Um, we have building construction and real estate. They're less interested in this program right now, but their day might come. I'm still hopeful. So what does it look like to help a colleague? What's your responsible actions? So each state is different. As we heard this morning, there's 53 jurisdictions and 54 different problems or ways of handling them. And so knowing and recognizing the symptoms, but also recognizing the duty to report in your state or the clinic that you work at, or the hospital that you work at. What are the rules, statutes, and laws there? And then following the policies and procedures of doing so. So reporting a colleague, what are some of the factors in not doing it? And I will tell you that numbers across the United States are down for PHP programs. You would think with COVID-19, the pandemic, the stressors, that the, there would be an influx. And I, and I think there will be an influx, I just don't think we're there yet. I don't think people um, are on the full other side of it, and so we just haven't seen those numbers come up. Um, but small practices, fewer um, healthcare professionals, you're less likely to turn in someone that you work with because then you're gonna take on more work. How are we gonna handle this work if we turn someone in? Um, there's a shortage, so if we turn someone in and they're not here, are we gonna be able to find someone to cover their shifts? Um, the closer the system, are you friends? Maybe you are family. If I turn them in, it doesn't really look great, so I'll just pick up the slack for them. Um, so these are some of the reporting a colleague and why people don't do it. Um, so for the state of Idaho, how would you report someone? You can always call my office. Uh, we actually outsource our program to a third party, so while I oversee the contract and make sure that they're being compliant, we outsource it to keep it even 
arm's length farther away from the board and the board staff because we don't need to know the evaluation details. We don't need to know what treatment looked like. Um, we want to help you and we want you to get the help that you need, but we don't need to be involved in the day-to-day. -day. So you can call and report yourself to that program. You can do an anonymous report to the board, which ultimately means it comes through me. Um, and then we have HRs and different directors. So signs of impairment. Again, I said I mostly give this presentation to physicians and nurses, so volunteering to do med counts is a, is a huge one. That's obviously not something you guys would deal with, but increased and prolonged breaks, um, agitation, depression, shakiness, sleepiness, emotional. I mean, the list goes on, and the issue is when we see these things, then we get hypersensitive. I don't want you to go back to work and someone has a bad day and you're like, oh, I bet they're dealing with substance use disorder. I should probably turn them in. Um, but these are just things to keep in mind that someone, when they have multiple of these, you know, they may have something and you have a duty as a human to just check in on your coworkers and make sure that they're getting help. So what are some of the barriers to getting help? Shame and stigma being one of them. In Idaho, being an umbrella agency has the luxury of working with other big boards. And so the Board of Medicine and the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation has been really looking at how do we destigmatize our licensure applications. And if we're gonna do it for the Board of Medicine, we're gonna do it for all of our boards. And so we've been really diving in on what's the best way to do this. Um, do we even need to ask the question of if you have, have you been struggling with substance use or mental health since you last renewed your license? Is it enough to just put an attestation that says you understand that taking care of yourself is the utmost importance? And that if you are struggling, list our recovery program so that they can reach out and get help and take the stigma out of that. We even took it a step further and we looked at our contracts for this recovery program and was the language in those stigmatizing? And they absolutely were. I mean, the, these programs go back to 86. So you think of some of the language we used back then to what we're using now. So we've changed all of our contracts. Um, we don't even use the term relapse anymore. We're trying to use the term return to use and destigmatize that. Um, we don't say that I struggle with addiction. You struggle with substance use or alcohol use disorder and trying to make it um, more welcoming. So that's something that we're doing. There's a fear. There's a fear you're gonna lose your job, your family, your license, disappointing your loved ones, withdrawal. That's a huge fear for people. If you can't have a managed withdrawal, I mean, alcohol use disorder is one of the deadliest withdrawals. That and um, benzos. So people don't just want to stop um, Unwillingness or inability, and I, I wouldn't say that it's unwillingness. It's, again, that resources. I don't even know where to turn to ask for help. Um, and the cost of care. In Idaho, we have a couple different programs you can reach out to and get uh, scholarships, but we're also looking at our division of how can we partner with a 501c3 to have a scholarship to help people. So the role, our program's the HPRP. So we're in the center and we help the license, the licensee, we help the licensing board, we help the employer and the treatment program. We are the core and I will stand in front of your licensing board all day long and try to protect you as long as you're doing what you need to do. I will work with your employer to explain why you have restrictions on your license if you do or why you're in this program. I will do everything I can to help you as long as you're doing everything you can to stay clean and sober. There's two different referral types in the state of Idaho, and I would venture to say there's really three now, but two being a self-referral and a board referral. And then sometimes you need to take uh, time away from the bedside or the practice of physical therapy or PTA um, and come back. And maybe you were disciplined. Maybe you were just not ready to get help, and so your board disciplined you. Previously in the state of Idaho, uh, with substance use or mental health, there really wasn't a clear pathway back to licensure if you had a substance use disorder or alcohol use disorder. Now we will let you join this program, get clean time, just like you're gonna have to do to return to the practice of having CEs and, and prove that you're competent, but build what I like to call a sober resume to bring before the board so that they have that peace of mind when they relicense you that you are okay and then continue to monitor you for a certain amount of time. So self-referrals, the board doesn't have to be involved. And most of the time when people call me, if there's not a pending complaint on file with me, 
I will tell them to stop and call our monitoring program. Don't tell me anything else incriminating. Like, let's just get you the help that you need and the board does not have to be involved. And then board referral. Um, sometimes we get complaints and sometimes that's how it has to happen. But I would say that we even take it a step further in the state of Idaho. The second that complaint comes in, if it's substance use or alcohol use related, the investigative team gives it to me first, gives me the opportunity to call that licensee and talk to them. If they identify as someone who's struggling with substance use or alcohol use disorder, we get them into the program and don't involve the board. Again, sometimes people aren't ready until that conversation is there. And so we try to offer this program right up until formal discipline is given. So why does monitoring work? Um, the average everyday individual who's struggling with substance use disorder goes to a 30-day inpatient treatment center, goes back out on the streets, has a three to 7% success rate of staying sober long-term, which is a gut-wrenching number. Um, our healthcare professionals in the state of Idaho have between a 75 and 85% success rate. Um, and it works because there's treatment and ongoing support it's an abstinence-based program. Regardless of how you got into the program, it's abstinence from all mind-altering substances. We have a relapse plan. We work with them to ensure they have a plan in place. We do random drug testing, mutual support groups. So we have support groups in Idaho that are just for healthcare professionals. It mirrors a 12-step meeting, but it's for only healthcare professionals in the program. And then we have leverage. We have the leverage of the license, which the everyday individual, when they go to treatment, they likely don't have that leverage. Mom and dad said we'll take your car away if you don't stay clean and sober. That doesn't always happen. And so with the licensing board, we have the ability to say, if you fail to comply, then we can take your license. And, and Ohio's program is, is pretty similar. I'm, so we'll kind of try to fly through a few of these slides, but um, ours is called the Ohio Professionals Health Program. Up until a few months ago, it was the Ohio Physicians Health Care Program. So health program, it, it recently expanded to as many health professionals as the program can get signed up. Did you want to go to the slide? Okay. Um, the, PHP encourages healthcare professionals to improve their health and well-being through educational and confidential well-being programs. And the confidential piece is the most important part. And I'll just say, uh, this is the piece the board had the most difficulty wrapping their brains around, this confidential. I, we are not, we need to know every single person who goes to this program and says that they have a problem. That, that was hard. We don't need to know. The idea is to get them to go before they have a problem. And so working through it, um, I'm, I'm actually I'm very proud of the board for taking that leap because we were one of the first ones in Ohio to, to do that uh, outside of the physicians. And um, so the confidential piece is, is also what makes it work because that's why people go seek the help. They'd rather talk to someone who's not the board and not their employer. Primary reasons, uh, the, uh, so this data, uh, the, the program, the Safe uh, Ohio Physicians Health Program at the time, now PHP, uh, did a survey in 2021 as we were starting to emerge from, from COVID uh, to do, a, they did a well-being survey and they got, they surveyed all license holders of all types, not just the physicians who they were serving at the time. And so they, one of the questions they asked was, you know, why don't you seek help? I think Timothy mentioned this before, time commitment, the cost, and didn't know where to turn. And, and this program solves a couple of those things. Uh, so we developed some rules to make sure that this was confidential. That was one of our first steps. And we did that. Uh, that's one reason it took a year to get up and running was working through that rules process. So, you know, we, we got it codified, uh, and um, again, the confidential, the confidentiality, and, and then having a, a safe path for them to go get the treatment 
really drove a lot of the discussions. Um, and then getting, getting them, getting the board comfortable, and of course, ultimately the patients comfortable with an organization that would give them the adequate screening and treatment and care, um, monitoring, right? Uh, so the guardrails on this program are important. You have to adhere to the program. And, and if you're there as a result of discipline and you fail out of the program, you're right back in front of the board, right? So you, you got some help, but it really requires them to, and, and the program keeps them on a curriculum. And again, the, the, the desire was to get them the help they needed and not discipline, right? I mean, if every person that came to us got drummed out of the practice for every micro infraction, right? It's if someone came to you as a physical therapist and they're hurt and you couldn't fix them, you don't call up the Elmer's factory and go, I got another one for you, right? You, you, you go and you, you get someone else to, to get them the care that they need or you come up with a different alternative uh, uh, way to treat them. It, this program gave us that latitude. So within that program, you know, they have multiple different disciplines and ways to, to get them the treat, treatment and care that they needed. Um, yeah, so any licensee or applicant who needs the assistance, again, it's behavioral, mental health, substance abuse disorders, or you know, medical condition or illness. Um, you know, with the, I think there's enough data out there that if you have a chronic injury and you start to take certain pain medicines, that can lead to addiction, right? So again, if, if trying to get ahead of even those situations. Um, as you've, as we've heard a couple times, our board is multidisciplined. You have athletic trainers, physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, I'm gonna get all the P's wrong, but orthos, prosthetics, prosthetic, physical therapies, I got those, and, and the uh, physical therapy assistants. Um, <coughs> so in, in ineligibility, this is, this is also important to the board. In order to protect patient safety and any, any licensees unwilling or unable to complete the program, including the screening, uh, screening and evaluation is deemed ineligible. You, you have to go through the process, right? As you've heard from Katie and, and myself and, and Missy, timing matters when you're ready matters, uh, but this is a big carrot stick situation, right? If you're facing discipline and you refuse treatment, you only leave the stick option, right? And that, that can lead to other issues that we're trying to cut off. And similar to what Katie mentioned, the services include mostly screening, referral to treatment. This, this is a monitoring program, so you do need to work with a, a provider that is approved through the program for the actual treatment. This program helps connect you with that. It helps make sure you're on track with that. It, it is kind of the, the de facto board in this case. Uh, the other piece of our rules, again, was the big part of duty to report. We did change our rules to say that you could fulfill your duty to report a colleague by reporting them to the, the PHP. Uh, that, that might be a little different from how some other states handle it, but that is um, the route we thought was best to keep that confidential nature. Um, and we also did change our rules. We have a rule in Ohio that you have to self-report if you have a positive drug or alcohol screen to the board within 30 days. Uh, we did change the rule that to say that if you are not part, you, you only need to do that if you're not part of the PHP. If you are participating in PHP, you do not have to make that report on yourself. However, if the presence of an impairment, if, if you're in the program and you uh, ha are not compliant and you have issues at work, you are going to get reported to the board and that's part of the contract you sign with the program. So what would you do if you were concerned? We, this is one of our slides that we do. One of the pieces of the launch of this was to offer an hour of CE free to all of our licensees who wanted to learn about this, and I had no idea how popular that would be. We blew out Zoom caps all over the place. Uh, so it was, it was a really good experience and, and a good lesson learned for me on how to get the word out. So uh, this is what we tell people. Call Ohio PHP. And this is the process, really similar to what Katie described for Idaho, uh, but 
PHP connects the well-being screen. If the licensee follows PHP, we never see them. But if they don't, it comes down to the board. Uh, again, I think we could talk, just trying to cruise through this so we don't run out of time. Uh, the other piece that is important to me and the board is uh, we get a quarterly report from the program to tell us how many people are participating, that sort of thing. Uh, so we had 14 people contact the program in the first six months. Personally, I thought that was outstanding. Um, I, I agree with Timothy. Even if it had been one, I would have been excited. That was 14 people who, who didn't know how to get help before. Um, and they give us data on how many people have taken the training and, um, and we'll continue to receive these updated reports quarterly. And when, when I asked the board how you know, why did you want to do this after we had been working on it about a year? Uh, this was kind of some of the response. It supports the push for preventative treatment. It protects the public. It helps with the disparity of accessing mental health services, especially for people without an employer resource or who don't want to go through the employer. And you hear that, uh, oh, the, I don't want to seek assistance because my employer will know because it'll bill my health insurance and I just don't, I don't want my employer to know. That stigma still exists. Um, so this gives another route. Um, the board has a duty to protect the public but not to be heavy handed. And uh, we thought this promoted open discussions with stakeholders. We have a lot of faculty on the board. They thought this was really important because you see seeds of this coming sometimes in your students. And to, so to talk to them about this kind of program and opportunity early on is important. Case studies. So uh, I think we just wanted to take a second to talk about how this can apply. Um, in Ohio, we've had uh, several cases, and, and, and I, I really think of this as two ways. That there, we, we don't know about the those 14 people that self-referred. I, I can't give you a case study. I don't know what happened, because the good news is we never heard about it, which means they're, they're hopefully doing well, or um, at least on the pathway to that. Um, but we do have cases. The other piece of this, and one of the main reasons we latched on to it in the beginning was, how many of you get those rehabilitation cases and you have no idea, you're being asked to decide whether that person's ready to return to work. Do you have any idea? Like, I always had a pit in my stomach. Are we really ready to set this person back to work? You're tr can, you can trust the opinion of another health professional, um, but do you really know? And so this gave us another resource to be able to return uh, to those folks to work. So a couple of cases we've used it in is uh, similar to Katie. We've had people call us and say they, they have a problem um, and we've asked them to contact this entity first before they go down the road with us. Um, we've also had people contact us who, uh, who tell us that, that where there's been an issue and uh, we had one, this was an OT, but it could be a PT just as well, uh, who couldn't seem to get their documentation done. And they had a diagnosable bipolar disorder. And uh, so we sent them to this monitoring program to hope to complete that compliance loop and help them do better uh, with their own treatment. Do you have any you want to mention? Okay, we're down to one minute. I did want to close with this one, because I also recognize that Ohio, we were struggling with this issue, but didn't know where to turn or didn't have a resource until a year or so ago. And so I, w I did want to say to those of you who may not have a professional's health program, there are still things you can do. And I, I regret that we didn't take some of these steps and do more. So a few things, you can find out if your state has a, a PHP that would partner with your profession. Pretty much every state, correct me if I'm wrong, has at least something with physicians. So it's worth that phone call. Find out what that group is and see if they'd be willing to take on the PT profession. Uh, contact the state agency in charge of mental health and substance use. It could be your public health agency. It could be uh, mental health or drug drug addiction, see if they have referral 
resources to offer that you could just put on your website. Um, communicate appropriate continuing education offerings in this space, uh, especially if they are free and offered by another state agency. I, I just That comes back to I learned how valuable free <laughs> CE is. Um, Examine the board dis your board disciplinary procedures to reduce the stigma related to mental health and substance use. One of my, one of the members of the Ohio board who has since come off, but he served his full nine years and much of it he served doing discipline enforcement cases, said to me that um, he was most excited about this because he thought that mental health and substance use were the root cause of so many issues we're seeing, even down to that continuing, continuing education discipline. I mean, I know you all see it. It's the person who just can't even seem to respond to a CE audit. And they may have even contacted the board and they know they're being audited. They just can't even seem to get their paperwork together. There's something else going on there. Nobody just sits there and says, ah, I'm not gonna respond. So it, you know, I, I look forward to being able to employ it in those kinds of cases. And then, um, Promote your state's suicide prevention line. The former mental health and addiction services employee in me said, you know, it's, it's 988 through the whole country now. So join your public health agencies in promoting how important that is. So our last slido is, in your opinion, now that we've gone through all that, how important is safe haven program for your jurisdiction? And while you answer that question, uh, we would love to take questions. And please wait for the microphone. Great job. Um, Claire Covert Bybee from Nebraska. So I have my board administrator hat on now. And in theory, I love this. And I love everything that you talked about. But some of the things I wonder, um, uh, particularly for Ohio PHP, did you have it written in your contract or in law certain requirements that were immediate patient safety that needed to be reported even if they were in the PHP? I saw that, um, that flow chart that kind of, it looked like it gave it uh, the decision making up to the PHP on wh whether or not to report and I'm just wondering if the board and the regulating agency actually defines that. Yes, uh, the MOU, good question, thank you. Uh, yeah. Am I coming out? Okay. The MOU that the agency has with the PHP program spells out some very specific things. Uh, it's everything you would expect, especially sexual boundary type things. Stacy from Georgia, I have two questions. One, if the candidate is evaluated by the PHP and is determined to not be a good fit, not necessarily because they don't want to comply, but maybe they don't have the particular resource that that candidate needs, um, what does the board, what happens in that case? So it depends on if it's a self-referral or a board referral. If it's a self-referral and we never knew anything about them, then they're going to let them go because you can't hold someone to a monitoring contract if they don't have a diagnosis to be monitored. And in the second case, if it was a board referral, join the PHP, get the help. You go for your inpatient evaluation and you don't have a diagnosis, it would come back to the board and we would review. Is there anything else that needs to occur? Other words, we'd need to close that case out. No, Ohio would be the same way. And then the second question I had, um, I heard uh, at some point someone, I think, believe it was you, Katie, about uh, grant monies, or I'm just wondering it, what services you all have available as it relates to the cost of going to that PHP, because again, they may want to comply, but may not can afford some of the evals, so is there an income-based approach or, or anything else that come up? So I think both of our programs are run differently in that sense. We pay a portion to our third party administrator for the day-to-day -day cost of running that program, um, but treatment is usually through insurance. With that being said, some people do get fired and they don't have insurance, and so that's where we use some of our state entities who have opiate use money or different you know, grant opportunities for people to get the treatment that they need. Um, and then, from there on out, it's, it's what their contract requires of them. 
they might need ongoing counseling or medication management or outpatient treatment, um, which will cost. And then there's drug testing. And so it is expensive. There's no doubt that that is one of the biggest hurdles. When we um, survey every graduate of the program, what was the hardest thing about the program? And the financial piece in the beginning is always the hardest part of that program of one, we've taken away uh, a lot of people's coping mechanisms of substance use disorder and then added this huge stressor of this large contract that now costs them a considerable amount of money. And so while these programs have been around since the 80s, we know that financial has been the hardest part of them and it's something that we're continuing to look at in the state of Idaho. And so Ohio, it's actually no cost to the, the patient um, because we have a fantastic director. We got a budget allow allowance through the state. No, that's not. I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that, that. Yes. No, no. The, the, but uh, seriously, it, it's also due to our fantastic governor, uh, who uh, places a huge emphasis on substance use. And when they, when the legislature started to see the statistics that this program brought back about the, that's the thing that surprised me the most. I have mental health and substance use experience, but I. I was surprised to see the statistics to show that health professionals have a higher rate of recovery. And I think the legislature latched onto that and decided to provide some of the federal recovery funds to help get this going. My name's Katie from Louisiana, and that was exactly my question for Ohio specifically, because I saw one of the slides that you went past that it was no cost to the participant. Do you mind giving us an idea of what that cost you guys for the PHP program? I, again, did I again recognizing that we were very blessed to get this opportunity? It did not cost the board. One day it might, and that is a uh, bridge. We hope we don't have to cross. Yeah. Um, but as far as how much it costs per participant, yeah, just I for those of us who wouldn't I have that funding, just getting a ballpark idea. I don't know that. That's a really good question that I'm going to go back and ask because I should. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's also, it'll be hard to say because we're sharing resources with a lot of professions, so sometimes volume drives that down um, as far as per person, but that's a, that's a really a good question. I will have to get back to you. Um, and the program you, is still sort of in its infancy, too, so we're developing data, so each year we'll get more and more, and, and treatment gets either more expensive or less expensive based on you know volume, like Missy said. So. I'm a, we have a board question for the next, uh, whenever we get together again, so. Katie Dale, Washington. Um, I'm interested in outcomes, actually. What is the ratio of ordered enrollments versus voluntary? And do you have any numbers on the outcomes? Um, how many have returned to use among those who who voluntarily entered the program versus those who were uh, mandated to enter the program? So since Idaho's programs have been around for quite some time, um, our statistics, uh, it doesn't matter board referral versus self-referral. Um, recidivism rates aren't extremely high. Um, I see them more in the professions. So. If you look at nursing, so LPNs and RNs, based on how much money they make, they go to an outpatient treatment where you have doctors, dentists, and pharmacists, their access, their knowledge base, they go to an inpatient treatment center, so they usually go to 90 days of inpatient treatment. The recidivism rate of someone who's taken three months away and gotten actual treatment is much less than someone who's done outpatient treatment and continued to be in the environment that likely they were using or struggling in. And so we see a much higher recidivism rate in uh, lower professions, techs, nurses, than we do in our advanced practice professions. And it's not based on whether they were self-referral or board referral. I would say it's equal parts. So for the state of Idaho, uh, her question was, what's for the recording? The question was the rates of self-referral versus board referral. And maybe 10 years ago, board referral would have been much higher than self-referral. And now I would say 80% of our referrals are self-referral versus board referral because we're working really hard to get them on the forefront of getting help when it's their idea versus the board's idea. 
And I would just add, I, the OTPTAT board hasn't been participating long enough to have like what I would call any significant data on success and recidivism, but uh, we have had, I think you saw on the slide, 14 self-referrals, and we've probably had like five, I'm looking at my team, five or so board referrals, and we haven't had any of the self-referrals come to us. We've had one uh, board referral come back. Um, Missy, this is, <laughs> this is not really a question for you. It's more of a, a, an assignment that I'll probably give back with you later on about. But um, just as you're asking those questions about the finances for um, uh, this, if you could find out if they may have tapped into some of the opioid task force resources associated with that, because I'd like to see how that crosswalked so I could piggyback on some of that. <laughs> I would be happy to look into that. I, I will tell you that some of those funds that you're talking about, you were given to this PHP to get more professions on board. So then, uh, yeah, I'll, I will, uh, I will look at that. They are starting to try to fundraise separately in case they don't have a full-time, long-term funding source. Um, so it's something we're definitely keeping an eye on. And I'm sorry, young woman from Washington, um, I. I I will try to remember and, and pester me if I happen to forget, but I'll try to put a link in the discussion of the app on this session to the Ohio PHP's report that has some of the statistics that you're looking for that, that are probably a little more specific to physicians because that's what they've been doing, but it does, you'll, I think you'll find it interesting. Michael Parisi, Connecticut. Um, just to back up a little bit, when we were, um, trying to get the compact through the legislature. There was a multidisciplinary group of people reviewing it. And there was this one woman who really had a, a problem with the idea of decreased number of licenses, but increased number of people because they get their um, payment through, they get a portion of the license uh, payments. And so we're scratching our heads. And, and then they said, well, we also have a problem with the compact licensure about self-reporting. Come to find out that there's a program called Haven in Connecticut. And nobody on the board knew about it. Nobody in our professional organization knew about them. And everybody that we, we uh, worked with on DPH knew nothing about it. So. Um, Part of the, so we lost that year and we had to go back to the legislature once they learned uh, that we were going to, or the professional organization was going to advertise and help push that to the professionals. But getting to know that the resources there is important. Um, and this was an alternative to discipline pathway. They don't actually provide the treatment, they set up the programs. Yeah, that's one reason I was wanted to do this session because I think there's more states that have these resources that maybe the PT boards may not even be aware because it's kind of a rapidly expanding idea. Yeah, Haven in Connecticut is a physician, pharmacist, dentist, nurse program. And so again, those were the core professionals that always had these recovery programs available to them. And it took me being the executive officer to realize that smaller boards didn't have this available to them much like our first responders and police officers don't have similar programs available to them. We've just looked at doctors, nurses, dentists, and pharmacists. We have one minute left. Any last questions? Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. I know you had other places to be this afternoon, and you chose us, so thank you.